Hello and welcome to The Wire. We often say before we start an interview that this is a very special interview. Uh, this is an old tactic or a trick of interviewers, but I have to say that today's episode or today's interview is indeed very special because I will be asking questions of Karan Thapar, who, as you all know, is one of India's topmost political interviewers with more than three decades uh, of experience, hundreds of interviews of national and international leaders under his belt. Karan, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us and for being on the other side, uh, as it were. A pleasure. Uh, the context of our conversation is obviously your book, Devil's Advocate, which uh, I should say your latest book because you've published many. But this is one. This is a book where you have, uh, in a way, given viewers and readers a glimpse into. Uh, some of the important memorable interviews that you've conducted over your, over your, over your career. And of course, uh, excerpts of the book have appeared. Uh, you've, we've, we've read about um, the Jalalitha interview, Advani, various others. The one interview which really stands out and your chapter which stands out and which has excited uh, or caused a lot of discussion is uh, your account of the famous interview, that interview with Narendra Modi, the one which he interrupts after a couple of minutes, asks for a glass of water. And um, you provide uh, an account of what happened in the room at that time, and also discuss what you believe to be the consequences of that interview uh, as the years progress, and particularly over the last few years when BJP spokespersons, leaders have essentially kept off uh, your television programs. Uh, I want to ask you to begin with, does it, does it upset you? You've done hundreds of interviews, that the one interview that's most watched on YouTube and the one that people talk and most remember is one that was aborted within the first couple of minutes. No, it doesn't upset me at all. Um, I suppose it's in inevitable that an interview with a man who was chief minister and he walked out after three minutes and then went on to become prime minister will be not just the most widely seen, but it's constantly resurrected each time Mr. Modi does a fresh interview as prime minister. It's brought up in comparison to the interview he's just done. It doesn't upset me. In a way, it even thrills me because it gives you a sense of, in quotes, publicity, a sense of notoriety or renown which is always welcome. Journalists like being recognized, like being seen, like being noted and talked about. So I can't claim to be upset. Did you, uh, did you, I mean, was there any prior discussion with Mr. I mean, surely Mr. Modi would have anticipated even five years after the Gujarat killings that an interview with somebody like you is bound to involve questions about his own role as chief minister. Wasn't he, didn't he know that this was going to happen? He should have guessed it. He should have more than just guessed it. He should have been prepared for it. There was no discussion with Mr. Modi whatsoever about the nature of the questions that would be asked to him. To be honest, till I arrived in Ahmedabad the morning of the interview, I hadn't actually spoken to Mr. Modi about the interview. The entire communication had been A, to his office in letters, and B, through Arun Jaitley, who'd helped to set it up. But there had been no direct communication in verbal communication with Mr. Modi whatsoever. When I arrived that morning, he rang me up and he said to me, Pohonch gaya, and I said, Hanji, my Pohonch gaya, and he said to me, interview to Shyam ko saadhe chaar baje hai, but come a little earlier, we'll have a cup of tea and gup shop. And I did, I got there earlier, and we had a very happy, uh, amicable conversation, exchanging anecdotes, getting to know each other. Again, nothing about the interview that was to follow was discussed. No questions were shared. No questions were asked for. So when the interview began, there had been no discussion about its contents prior to that. We know from the very few interviews that he's done as prime minister, and you, know, you can count them on the fingers of one hand, uh, that they have a very scripted feel. Certainly, it appears as if the questions uh, have been discussed, if not, you know, drafted uh, prior to these interviews. Uh, there are hardly any follow-up questions that seem to be permitted. Uh, do you think he's learnt a lesson from this? That I mean, after dealing with an unscripted kind of interview and the kind of disaster that it caused. I'm not sure if he's learnt a lesson from the interview he did with me. That would be presumptuous on my part to claim. But certainly he is very cautious. He doesn't like being surprised by questions he's not prepared for. More importantly, he likes to be fully briefed for those that he's going to address and face. And therefore he, I think, gives fairly clear indications, or so I've been told, 
to the people who are interviewing him that he'd like the questions in advance. I'm also told that he indicates which are acceptable and which are not. Uh, if you speak candidly to those who've interviewed him, they'll more or less admit this is the case. Yes. Obviously, they don't publicize it yes. because that would undermine the interview. Yes. But I think he does this because he wants to be prepared. He doesn't want to be taken by surprise. He wants to be in command, in control. Yes. Uh, as an interviewer, you aren't averse to sketching the broad contours of what ground you will cover before an interview, right? I mean, if, if he, had, he, had he asked you, Karan, what are we going to talk about? If he'd asked me what are we going to talk about, I'd have readily shared with him the yeah. subjects we were going to talk exactly. about because I think that's only fair. Exactly. And even in England, where I began my journalism, I worked in London Weekend Television for about 10 years, it was common practice to brief your interviewee about the subjects you would raise. Yes. But no one would ever give them any idea of the specific questions. Yes. And those questions could be, easy, they could be lollipops, or they could be awkward and difficult. That was the choice of the interviewer. Right. Um, when he interrupted the interview uh, at the first instance to say that he, he was tired, he wanted water, did you, did you think, did you have any sense that this was curtains, this was the end, or were you genuinely surprised when he then said, I'm getting up and that's it? For the first second or two or maybe five, I actually genuinely thought he wanted water and I said to him, I think it, I'm there on the tape saying, it, Pani, aapke bagal mein hai, ga. By not letting people hear the message repeatedly, you're allowing an image that is contrary to the interest of Gujarat to continue. It's in your hands to change it. Oh, I'll have to rest. Horrible water. Yeah. Yeah. Pani, aap Pani, dosti bani rahe. You came here, I'm happy, I'm thankful to you. I can't wait to sit but then I realized from his follow-on that it wasn't just the Pani that he wanted because he began removing his mic and he made it clear that the interview as far as he was concerned was over. He kept saying, Hamari dosti bani rahe. But that was being said as a sort of valedictory end of interview statement yeah. to suggest that he wasn't going to have a fight with me, he wasn't going to quarrel, he wasn't going to show anger, but the interview was definitely over. Yeah. Now you very gamely, as your book says, very sportingly offered him the chance of recording again when he was more comfortable, etc. Uh, he didn't accept that. In uh, fact, I went one step further. I even said to him that the questions I had asked him about Godhra and Ahmedabad could have been put right at the end if we agreed to do the interview. If they don't have to be the start, they could be in the end if he felt more comfortable with yeah. them coming in that order. Secondly, I said to him that if you only leave me with two and a half or three minutes, which is the length of the interview before he walked out, then this will be shown in every single bulletin because it will become a news item yeah. and it will attract attention simply because he walked out, not for any other reason. Whereas if he did the full interview, it would be shown once, repeated once and forgotten about thereafter. And I tried very hard to explain this to him. In fact, I spent an hour in his company. He was, I have to add, extremely hospitable. He gave me tea, he gave me mithai and dhokla. Uh, he couldn't have been more hospitable. I spent that time trying very hard to persuade him one way or another to do the interview. I failed and at that, when, it, when I failed, I simply said to him, I said, look, we've run out of time. I've got to get to the airport. I've got a plane back to Delhi and I'm really sorry I failed because I think there is a mistake happening here. We should have done the interview, but obviously it's your prerogative. You lost an interview and you gained an eternally viral news item. Uh, so I would say this was your gain, <laughs> journalism's gain, Mr. Modi's loss. But the interview or the aborted interview uh, also appears to have had uh, a different sort of afterlife. Uh, you recount in your book how um, over the past few years you became aware of, you were in fact informed by uh, people in the BJP. You identify Sambit Patra as one of the people uh, who say that um, in fact the party does not want any spokesperson or any minister to come on your shows. This was when you were at India Today, perhaps earlier at CNN, IBN. Um, and the book recounts how you then began to reach out to the Bharati Janata Party leaders, Jaitley, Amit Shah and others, to try to get to the bottom of A, whether there is indeed a boycott and B, if so, um, why this might be the case. Uh, tell us briefly what happened when you contacted Arun Jaitley, when you contacted Amit Shah. The problem began manifesting itself, or maybe I should say I began to realize there was a problem somewhere towards the last quarter of 2016. My last interview with someone from the BJP was Ram Madhav on the 17th of January 2017. But before that interview with Ram Madhav, I had sensed there was a problem. So on one if, occasion... If I can just interrupt you. So from 2007, when this infamous aborted interview happens, to 2016, you didn't 
particularly encountered a problem? Did, did things change after There was no problem at all whatsoever. Not even after Mr. Modi became PM? Not even after Mr. Modi became PM. There were endless interviews with BJP ministers right up till 2016 yeah. end yeah. or even early 2017. Um, there were the presence of BJP spokesmen on my programs regularly uh, every single day if needed. There was no shortage then. They were quite happy to come. Um, but in 2016, towards the end, when I sensed there was a problem, I said to Sambit Patra, what is the problem? And he said to me, can I tell you in confidence? And I said, of course. And I have breached that confidence. I wouldn't for a moment deny I haven't. He said to me, we've been told not to appear on your show. I then discovered that not a single spokesperson was prepared to appear on my show and very shortly thereafter ministers, people like Venkaya Naidu, people like Nirmala Sitaraman, Piyush Goyal, Ravi Shankar, all of whom had readily given interviews, not one or two but many, suddenly stopped giving interviews. Nirmala Sitaraman, for instance, fixed one on two separate occasions and backed out literally at the last moment and I said this is too much of a coincidence. Clearly she's beginning to realize she's being told interviews are not to be given to Karan. It was wrongly fixed when she agreed to do it. Now she's been told before this happened and the interview was cancelled. At that point, Prakash Javdekar rang me and he was the last BJP minister to actually stop giving interviews. He carried on for a while after the others had stopped. He suddenly rang me and said, Karan, tumhara mere party ke problem kya hai? We are being told not to give you interviews and he suggested that I should speak to Adhyakshi to sort out the matter. Prakash Javdekar was the first formal time I was being told by someone senior in the BJP yeah, there that was there was a problem. problem. He didn't speak in confidence to me or anything. I then contacted Arun Jaitley who I have known over the years and almost considered a friend. Oh, I think he considers me one too. And I rang him up and I said, can I come and meet you? I went and met him in the finance ministry and I explained the problem and he says, Karan, honestly there is none. You're imagining it. There isn't a problem. You're just imagining it. These are just problems that happen because on a particular day, maybe three or four people coincidentally weren't available and you're assuming it's more than just unavailability. When this continued for two or three weeks, I spoke to Arun a second time. This time I rang him on his mobile and I said, Arun, this problem is continuing. You assured me there wasn't a problem, but it's carried on for another three, four weeks. And this time he said somewhat differently, don't worry, it will blow away. And I said, if it's going to blow away, clearly there's something to blow away. Clearly there is a problem, but you're saying it will sort itself out on its own. But it didn't. And at that point, I said to myself, I need to take matters in hand because as a journalist, you can't keep getting boycotted. It's silly. I can't understand why I am being boycotted. I don't see what the problem is. So let me try and sort it out. Was this causing grief at work? Were your employers at India Today also getting upset that you're not able to get BJP people? Well, we were getting BJP people, but not spokespersons. We were right. getting other BJP MPs and BJP members, but not the official okay. spokespersons. So yeah. we, were, we found a way around it, much as NDTV finds a way around it at the moment today, from what I can By get. getting sundry RSS people and so on. Yeah. Sundry yeah. RSS yeah. people or by getting people who are BJP members, but members of the national executive, not right. official designated spokespersons. Um, so there's a BJP presence, right. a BJP person, but not an official designated person. At that point, I realized I needed to tackle this problem because no journalist wants to have a boycott continuing. Secondly, I felt I needed to know why it was happening. And thirdly, I'll be honest with you, I said, if I have inadvertently done something that was wrong and mistaken, I have no great pride in apologizing for it, but I need to know if I've done something because as far as I'm concerned, I'm not aware of doing anything. So I went and contacted Amit Shah. I went and met him the day after Holi in 2017. Forgive me, before I come to Amit Shah, let me tell you, in January 2017, when my last interview with a BJP person happened, Ram Madhav, I thanked him afterwards and my entire crew was standing around, including my producer, Arvind Kumar, and Amit, uh, sorry, Ram Madhav said to me, you may thank me, my party won't. They don't think I should have given you an interview and they'll be upset I have, but I don't believe in boycotting people. And those were his words said publicly in front of six people. So once again, it was no great secret. He wasn't hiding it. He was quite happy to reveal this publicly. That motivated me to go and meet Amit Shah. I met him the day after Holi 2017. I was with him for about two or three minutes, sitting in his drawing room in Akbar Road. It was just the two of us in the room. I rapidly explained what the problem was. I told him that what Javdekar and Ram Madhav had said. I didn't, of course, name Sambit Patra, but I also told him about my conversations with Arun Jaitley. And his answer to me in a nutshell was that he's not aware of any problem. Very possibly, I'm 
assuming there is one where there isn't. I'm far too senior a journalist, he added, to be boycotted by anyone. But he said, since you've come to see me, let me look into this matter and get back to you in 24 hours in case there is some misunderstanding down the line and we'll clear it up. So I walked out of his meeting fairly confident that the matter had been resolved. I was completely wrong. Since then, 15 months and more have passed. Having promised to ring me back in 24 hours, he's never rung me. I've written him multiple letters, maybe 20 or 25, asking what the end result of that was. I had no he never response. Got back. And then you I escalated matters to... Eventually, I escalated matters in May. I went and met Nrupendra Mishra and I spoke on the phone to Ajit Doval. Nrupendra Mishra, very sweetly, forgive me, it was the other way around. I went and met Ajit Doval and spoke to Nrupendra Mishra. The, the principal secretary of the PM. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Ajit Doval is the national security yeah. advisor. Nrupendra Mishra heard me out and said, let me have a word with Mr. Modi. And he rang me back two days later to say he had. The Prime Minister felt it wasn't worth meeting Karan. Karan was incorrigible. He wouldn't change. Karan was prejudiced against the Prime Minister. Right. I then rang up Ajit Doval, to whom I had also spoken, and Ajit Doval said, well, I hope the matter sorts itself out. Right. And there it ended right. until October 2017, when I was interviewing uh, Pavan Varma. It was shortly after recording the JDU, an interview. The former IFS officer and JDU leader. And Pavan it was Varma, shortly yeah. after recording an interview for The Wire. When he was sitting in my office having a cup of coffee, his eyes fell on the photograph of Mr. Modi on the wall, which has Mr. Modi removing his mic. And there's a CNN caption on top which says, can't do this interview. And Pavan said, is that the moment when he walked out? And I said, yes. And Pavan said, I have a story to tell you. Prashant Kishore had said to him, Pavan Varma. Prashant that, Kishore is, of course, the poll strategist or was the poll strategist for the BJP and, and for the JDU as well, Narendra Modi. And, and for, for the, the JDU, JDU as well, yes. separately, separately and later, later on. Yes. And Prashant Kishore said to Pavan Verma that he, Prashant, had shown that two and a half, three minute aborted interview to Modi some 20, 30 times because he wanted Modi to learn from it how to handle awkward questions, how to handle awkward moments and not walk out again. Yeah. Secondly, he said that Modi had told him, Prashant Kishore, that he had kept Karan for a whole hour, offered him hospitality because he wanted Karan to leave thinking there was no ill will on Modi's part. And that is true because as I told you, Modi kept me for a whole hour. Yeah. But Modi added to Prashant Kishore, I will never forget what's happened and I will take my revenge. And I assume right. that somewhere towards the end of 2016 or early 2017, when BJP spokesmen were told not to appear on my show, when ministers were told not to give me interviews, and when in fact the boycott began, that's when the revenge was well, we implemented. Hope that is the extent of the revenge. And so <laughs> there, there aren't any other manifestations. But Karan, look, uh, we, we were delighted to run this excerpt uh, uh, on the wire. Uh, I found it hugely interesting. Uh, but I have to say that there was a huge blowback, negative, a uh, lot of negative commentary on social media. I'm sure you've seen a lot of this. And uh, I, I do feel I want to put some of those questions to you. Uh, the, broadly speaking, there were three uh, criticisms of this narrative or your account. First, uh, that why did Karan, and this came from, from admirers of yours uh, who loved the interview with Modi, the aborted interview, why did Karan have to try to apologize? Why was he groveling? Uh, uh, it's, uh, that is one line of criticism. Let me answer that okay. before you come to the other yeah. two. I wasn't apologizing. What I was seeking to do was to find out what had gone wrong what justified this boycott and if in the process I were to discover that I have made inadvertently some error or some mistake, something that journalistically would be wrong for me to have done, I added I would have no problem apologizing for it because I don't see this as an issue of false pride and prestige. If I've erred in some way yeah. as a human being, I have no problem apologizing. But I wasn't saying that I'm going to apologize yes. to win back the support or the presence of BJP spokespersons. I said that if you can show to me that I've done something wrong and there is a huge if there, exactly. I have no problem apologizing in, in, for In a way, you're, you're putting the burden on them to say what is it about that interview that exactly. they didn't like. Are they, is Modi or somebody on Modi's behalf going to say we did not like Karan asking us questions about 2002, for example. Uh, hardly something that they're going to volunteer as... Uh, First of all, they'd have to accept that the boycott happening in 2016-17 was because of an interview that happened in 2007, 10 years earlier. Given that in the interim 10 years, I had endless interviews with the BJP, both when they were in opposition and also during the first two years of government. So suddenly for that interview of 2007 to become a problem in 2017 without any explanation is... 
not just inexplicable, it's bizarre. Could we say that your so-called offer to apologize if you uh, are found to have done something wrong is similar to Narendra Modi saying that if I'm guilty of allowing Dalits to be killed, you can hang me on the streets? Well, I suppose in terms of rhetoric, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but in terms of intent, Obviously. no. Uh, the second criticism, Karan, uh, has to do with uh, so-called confidentiality of sources. Uh, we've had reporters vent as to how they would rather go to prison than betray sources, etc. And they say, well, Karan outed Sambit Patra, who you quote in the book as saying, can you keep a secret, uh, etc., etc. Tell us a little bit about your response to that. I'll tell you, I don't deny for a moment that I have betrayed Sambit Patra's confidence. He asked me if I could keep a secret. I said I could, and on that basis, he told me that he had been, and all other spokesmen had been told not to appear on my shows. But the reason I reveal that is because shortly after Sambit Patra gave me this information in confidence, it was conveyed officially and formally and without any sense of secrecy by A. Prakash Javdekar. Then it was confirmed by Arun Jaitley, who said the issue will blow over. And finally, it was explicitly and bluntly stated by Ram Madhav. And thereafter, I felt to reveal what Sambit had said is no longer going to be a betrayal. In other words, what was told to you in confidence by Patra was told to you officially by people above him in the food chain. Thus, uh, in a way, including a general secretary, yes, exactly, including the exactly. finance minister, including uh, Prakash Javdekar. Right, right. The third criticism, Karan, uh, uh, and this stems from the very public denial of uh, from Bhavan Verma. He says, "I, you know, we did not. I did not say what Karan has been saying." Uh, and people say that you may have misquoted him at best or at worst, again betrayed a confidence. Well, let me answer that. It's very simple to do. There is no doubt that the conversation that happened with Pavan was a private conversation because there were only two people in the room. So it was strictly a private conversation in that sense. But it wasn't a confidential conversation. During that period of time, there were a couple of other conversations I had with Pavan where he explicitly, repeatedly and unequivocally told me to keep the content of that conversation private. Nothing of the sort in any shape or manner was said or even hinted at with regard to relating what Prashant Kishore had said to him. Secondly, given that Prashant Kishore's story is so germane and so critical to me and it affects me rather than anyone else, it's a bizarre thing to expect that I would not want to make it public, yeah. particularly when you haven't forbidden me from doing so. Now. When that tweet came out, within half an hour I rang up Pavan. If I recall correctly, he was still at Patna airport. At least that's what it sounded like when he spoke to me on the phone. And the first thing he said to me was, why didn't you consult me before you went public? And I said, Pavan, I can easily answer that. A, because it wasn't confidential. B, there's no doubt that you were being indiscreet in telling me this. And for me to have said to a friend, please confirm an indiscretion, is to put you in an embarrassing position. You'd either have to confirm an indiscretion and make your position worse, or deny that you said it, which would mean that you'd be put into a position of lying. And it would be embarrassing for me to put a friend into that position, which is why I said, I'm not forbidden from saying it. It's not confidential. I know he was indiscreet in telling me, but clearly he wanted me to know, and I am going to now use it not in a wrong way, but simply to support what I believe is true. Finally, in that conversation, Pavan also said to me, and how do you know you aren't using it out of context? To which I said, Pavan, no matter what the context, it won't change the meaning of what Prashant Kishore said to you. So how does the context matter? Matter. With the benefit of hindsight, uh, would, you have, you know, would you have given Pavan, would you, would you rather have given Pavan a heads up that this was going to come in the book? No, I think even with the benefit of hindsight, if I'd rung him up and said, Pavel, I'm going to put this in the book, right? I would first of all have been telling him that I'm going to make public an indiscretion, because clearly revealing it to me was an indiscretion on his part. And he would have been then in the embarrassing position to either say, all right, go ahead. I'm quite happy to be seen as indiscreet. Or he would have had to say, no, please don't, in which case he'd be saying, please don't go public with what I told you, please cover up for me. And either way, it would be embarrassing for Pavan. And by the way, let me add, because I think this is important, my personal relationship with Pavan has not suffered. He was dining with me last night. <laughs> and Pavan continues to be right, a dear friend. Right. This is a situation where, to use a phrase that is more common in the English language, I would say that he hasn't lied. He's had a senior moment. Right. He's forgotten what he said. Right. He said it at a time right. when the JDU, his party's relationship with the BJP, was, was considerably more strained than it yes. was. At that particular point of time, Pavan was repeatedly saying to people, when he was also seen to be critical of his own party, with his own party for having joined the BJP, yeah. 
He repeatedly said to people that he wouldn't resign from the JDU, he would wait for the JDU to sack him. He said much the same thing in the interview I did with him for The Wire. Yeah. And after all, remember this, this particular discussion which I'm quoting in the book happened minutes after that interview for The Wire yes. was completed or minutes before it happened. I'm not sure which side of it it was. So honestly, yeah. the context has changed. Because the context has changed, Pavan's sense of concern about an indiscretion is much greater than it would otherwise have been. And that's why he's had what I call a convenient senior moment. And Prashant Kishore, has he got back to you? No, no? not at all, in no shape or form. Right, right. Um, uh, Which I assume he would have done, right. because he too would be keen to correct an image and impression if what was being quoted mm. was A, false and B, hurtful yes. to him. In the few minutes that we have left, Karan, I want to build on what we've just discussed. Uh, it seems to me that, and, and you know, build on it to perhaps review the wider state of health of the Indian media. It seems to me that um, the reason this boycott on you gets enforced by the BJP uh, around the time that it does, end of 2016, probably has something to do with a sense of vulnerability that the party and the government was feeling and perhaps still feels about its public performance, about, its pu about the public perception of its performance. And obviously central to this perce public perception is uh, the whole question of media management. Uh, the interviews that we've seen the Prime Minister give and the treatment of government policy and government decisions uh, on many channels today, I would say leaves a lot to be desired, at, journalistically speaking. Uh, I can't recall when is the last time I have seen such a large section of the media uh, pretty much serve as spokespersons for the government. And, you know, the fact is that you were an exception to that. Um, I always found your interviews to be fair, uh, but they were combative. You always asked questions uh, that perhaps others didn't like to ask. And do you think that was the reason that, in other words, sure, you had a history with Mr. Modi, but you were also, the boycott was also the product of, you were also a victim of the party and the government's growing intolerance towards journalists who did not want to play ball the way they saw it. Possibly. Um, it's possible that the BJP or the government or the establishment saw Karan as an awkward customer who will never see things our way, is always prone to ask difficult questions that are in a sense the opposite of what we would like to be addressed. And therefore, it's better and easier not to have to deal with him than to have to face his questions and think of suitable answers to them. And I can see how from their point of view, it made sense, avoid Karan altogether, because then we don't have this problem of how do we address the questions he's raising? What is the best answer to give him? Does he have an attitudinal problem? Is it based upon prejudice? Why is it that he's always singling us out? One of the things the BJP forgot, and this may possibly be an explanation, is that there was a certain change in the manner in which Karan questioned them after they came into government in 2014 compared to how he would have questioned them when they were leaders of the opposition. And that's because they were in power. And when, because they were in power, they were responsible for things that were happening and therefore they were responsible for the way the mood of the country was changing and you question the government very differently, far more assertively, perhaps even aggressively. When they're in opposition, right, nine times out of ten, you're sometimes you're talking to them about things that the government has done and giving them an opportunity to be critical of the government and then you find flaws with their criticism. But at least in the first instance, they've got that chance to criticize the government because they are in the opposition. So I think the BJP couldn't realize and couldn't accept that there would be a change in the tone, tenor and character of the interview once they came to power. Right. Uh, Karan, you've worked at a number of media establishments. Uh, have you experienced, uh, not just under the present government, but earlier governments, pressure from management, bhai usko interview mat karo, don't ask this kind of question, drop a certain guest, uh, you know, how does this work, this kind of pressure? I'll tell you, I have frequently, well, frequently is the wrong word, I have often faced pressure in terms of guests that we can have on a show. Never really in terms of don't interview A or B or C. Interviews tend to be one-to-ones and most channel heads or management realize that in a one-to-one -one situation, the person you're interviewing has a more than adequate chance to respond to whatever you may say. But in a discussion, there seems to be concerns about three things. A, the 
credentials or the background of the person you're inviting. And sometimes channels would say, don't invite him or her because he or she is the sort of journalist we don't like. And there was a whole list of people that have been told to me should not be invited on my shows at different various points of time by different channels. You're on that list. Nija Chaudhary was on that list. Arti Jairat was on that list. Praveen Swami was on that list. Bobby George was on that list. And it was astounding. Bobby Ghosh. Uh -huh. Bobby Ghosh, I beg your pardon. I mean, these are people who are leading journalists of their time. They appear on television channels on all the other stations. And yet, at that particular point of time, I was told don't have them. And that was to do with the character of the person. The second reason people have objections is because they sometimes say uh, you need to have more voices representative of this side and therefore please add another person in. and I would say surely one is sufficient why do we need two or three because it unbalances the discussion right. but that was a second order of concern right. have more voices to represent that side and this sort of concern which I would actually call manipulation of a program has happened sometimes fairly frequently uh, with several channels, not just one. And is this more a product? Is it happening more frequently now than it did in earlier under earlier? What I can't say is there truthfully about what the situation is post my stopping making programs for India Today, which right. was the 14th of April 2017. Right. But prior to that, not just on India Today, but also on other channels, there was an attempt to make sure that you didn't have a particular guest if that guest was not liked by management or you did have a particular person or you perhaps had a particular spread of people. That did happen, I would say, almost increasingly. Does the current state of Indian news television worry you, Karan? Yes, indeed. It worries me for three reasons. One, the manner in which we interview the Prime Minister on the rare occasions that he gives us the opportunity to do so. It's done in the most servile way. Instead of challenging him, on certain key core issues, he's questioned about what the opposition has done and given an opportunity to criticize his opponents. Secondly, the subject changes almost with every question as a result of which there is no focus attention and therefore no focus pro probing. Thirdly, there is no cross-questioning, there is no challenging of what he said. As a result of which, the interviews seem as if they're providing a platform to the Prime Minister, much like a speech. And he's allowed to answer at length, sometimes rambling, without any attempt to bring him back. That's one huge concern, the way we interview the Prime Minister. Even Donald Trump is not interviewed in this way in America. A second concern is the nature of television discussions we have and how anchors behave. If the anchor agrees with your view, he or she will give you as much opportunity as possible to talk, even if you're rambling. But if your view is the opposite of the anchors or opposite of the view the anchor wants to put across as the belief of the channel, you're interrupted, you're heckled, questions are hurled at you before you finish the last one, you're treated rudely, you're even at times shamed and humiliated. And that, to my mind, is not just rude, it also undermines the essential reasons why discussions happen, which is to expose the audience to a variety of different viewpoints spoken by different voices, leaving it to the audience to judge and decide for themselves who they agree with and who they don't. You simply air the different viewpoints and probe and point out the problems with those positions, but the audience is left to decide for itself. Here, the anchor is determined to push his line to the exclusion of any other option. The third thing that I find irritable is that often news television these days ends, particularly television news, with the anchor commenting on the story he or she has just read out. So they actually end up telling you what to think about the story. It could be silly, futile comments like, isn't that a terrible story? Through to, oh dear, what a shame, it makes me cringe. And you say to yourself, it's a kind of editorialized this comment. editorializing is not just unacceptable, it's unwelcome. More importantly, it treats the audience like children and so it's diminishing. We have an intelligence of our own and should be left to judge for ourselves whether we approve, disapprove, like or dislike. We don't need to be told. It's much like a newspaper editor putting a comment at the bottom of every front page story telling you what to think of the story you've just read. Yes. And I think the fourth thing that I would point out is those infantile and infantilizing hashtags the television deploys to dragoon and marshal your thoughts and corral you in a particular direction. Things like proud to be Indian, right? Anti-nation JNU, right? Hateful Pakistan. I mean, those are childish hashtags. There are more intelligent ways of coining conveying a mood language or, yeah. and conveying a mood rather than this sort of thing. Right. These are the four principal concerns I have. Uh, Karan Thapar, you've been very generous with your time. You've written a fabulous book. I would urge all our readers to 
uh, go out there and get a copy if you want to understand what makes Karan Thapar tick and the secret sauce for your interviewing style. Uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. Thank you, Siddharth. A pleasure. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.